What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Thank you for clicking onto this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. Rise of the Seljuk Empire, nomadic civilizations by kings in general. Let's go. See what I mean? Oh no, I didn't even click the button. Once again, I'll get the streaming thing done properly one day. While our previous videos on the nomadic peoples from Central Asia's vast steppe might have informed you on a new tribe or confederation, almost everyone, history buff or otherwise, knows of the Seljuks. Mm -hmm. After bursting into the high... Well, surprisingly, I actually didn't know the Seljuks until I started reacting to this channel. Um, so I'm definitely glad I started finding out more about them. Medieval Middle East, these fearsome conquerors created a vast empire. The Turkic incursions into the traditionally Greek Anatolia would, centuries later, blossom into the mighty Ottoman Empire. Mm. However, to begin that story, we must travel hundreds of years into the past and, once again, look at events transpiring on the vast grasslands of Eurasia. We understand that not everyone likes the ads, but thanks to this ad from Raid Shadow... Sorry. <laughs> at some point in the late 8th century, Probably during the reign of Abbasid Caliph al Mahdi, a horde of Turks, known as the Oghuz, migrated west into the vast steppe region between the Caspian and Aral Seas. This area became home to the so called Oghuz Yabku state, in which nomads would migrate vast distances in order to secure optimal seasonal pasturage for their herds. Okay, that's interesting. Though there were some sedentary settlements in this area. The imperial legacy left by the Gurkturks had been inherited by the Khazars, so, to whom the Oghuz appear to have been at least loosely subordinated to. It is in the late 10th century yeah. Khazar realm that we find our first references to the Oghuz Turkic warlords, known to history as Dukak and his son, who we know as Seljuk. According to records composed during the reigns of later Seljuk sultans, the ancestors of their dynasty served Khazaria's Kagan as military commanders. Interesting. This seems to imply that Seljuk and his father were active near Ito and might, like most of the other elite Khazars, have embraced Judaism. Hmm. During the Khazar disintegration during the 960s, Seljuk migrated east with a small band. The true reasons for this are shrouded under the historical veil. Oh, we don't know. But That's ranged a shame. from court intrigues to rebellion by Seljuk himself. Modern scholars mm. even argue that changing climate might have forced Seljuk and his group to migrate in order to escape pasture shortage. Seljuk led his band of 100 horsemen, 1500 camels and 50,000 sheep to the town of Jand, located on the fringes of Islamic Khwarezm. Jand was the first Muslim-ruled region through which Seljuk's roving band passed, and it is there that Seljuk embraced the Islamic faith. Okay, this so is he's a gone crucial there. moment in history, as it was a conversion which would have immense consequences. With that, yeah, because because obviously he would, yeah. Seljuk supposedly managed to gain more followers from the Turks of that frontier who incline towards holy war, men who seem to have been Ghazi, warriors of Islam. This brings us to the reason. Oh, so more people started following and coming to him. For this okay. increasing Islamization of the Turks, outlined by Korean historian Kim Ho Dong, Islam provided nomadic tribal people with the consciousness of a homogenous religious community mm -hmm. and religious sanction for the expansion of the domain of Islam, becoming an ideology of unification as well as an ideology of expansion. I see. This is essentially all we know about Seljuk himself, who died in Jand in 1009. Oh. According to some sources, at the age of 107. At that point, the region had been going... Sorry. At the age of 107? Sources at the age of 107. At that point, the region had been going through an upheaval for over a decade. Two militant new realms, the Karakhanids in Transoxiana oh. and the former Turkic slave Ghaznavid. Sorry, two seconds, guys. ...in Khorasan and the Oxus emerged, consuming vast tracts of the collapsing Samanid Emirate. Compounding this were events on the Eastern Steppe, where nomads known as the Khitans were disrupting matters in the process of their expansion into what the Chinese would call the Great Liao. 
This pushed waves of agree. refugees towards the Islamic world's frontiers, right where Seljuk's tribes were located. The Seljuks now began to gain strength rapidly, probably due to their ability to absorb many of these rowdy, disaffected nomadic warriors, many of whom converted to Islam and became Ghazi. After the progenitor's death, his elder son Arslan Israel became the tribe's chief, and we find him intervening in Transoxiana's politics, supporting a Karakhanid prince known as Ali Tegin, who okay, tried to establish himself wow, a lot's happened. Okay. as ruler of Bukhara in 1020. Tegin was opposed by his own brother's most powerful supporter, Mahmud, Sultan Why was he opposed? It was in a military engagement on the steppe outside Bukhara that the Sultan of Ghazni first saw the Seljuks, and was somewhat awestruck with their numbers. Oh, there no was that many of them. No a small band of a hundred people, they were now an increasingly potent threat. Mm, Mahmud's response this is an was issue. to seize and imprison Israel, either in battle or by intrigue, hoping that this would simply dissolve the burgeoning Seljuks, but he was wrong. Mahmud of Ghazna's actions did lead to some Seljuks joining his own Ghaznavid realm as soldiers, while some chose to flee west into Iran. However, most remained where they were, and a struggle for leadership began. Oh. By its end, three figures had taken their place at the top of the Seljuk mm -hmm. hierarchy, Chagri and Tugril, who were the sons of Israel's brother Mikail, and Musa, another relative of the inner clan. While the Seljuks were sorting themselves out, Mahmud's 32-year reign came to an end, and the Sultanate was inherited by a son, Masud, in 1030. Despite resolving their own leadership contest, the growing Seljuks were defeated in battle by the Karakhanids of Alitegin. Oh, they were defeated! No longer safe where they were, they the had Seljuk to flee tribe again. decided to flee towards Khurasan. They were assisted in this by a treacherous Ghaznavid governor in Khwarezm known as Harun who helped the nomads pass through his lands in return for their help in conquering Khurasan province from his sovereign. Despite Harun's assassination at the hands of Masud's agents in 1035, the Seljuks continued south. They just continue. <laughs> okay. Eventually, they arrived in a town known as Nasser, located mm -hmm. in the mountains of Khurasan. Khurasan was an important province. It was one of the jewels in the crown of Ghaznavid power, and now seemed very vulnerable. While nomadic life and reputation is often a very ruthless one, the Seljuks weren't just wandering mass killers hungry for conquest. They were people seeking more prosperous lives for themselves and their families. So rather than invading, the Seljuk chiefs offered a diplomatic proposal to the Ghaznavid governor, Suri, explaining their situation and exodus, and asking him to intercede with Sultan Masud on their behalf. Okay, that's actually really interesting that they took that approach. The Seljuks essentially pledged their service and mm -hmm. homage to the Sultan and his court, promising to rest in his great shadow if only they were granted a small province of their own on Khurasan's frontiers where they could settle. How little that is true, because it's going to change, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? They've become such a big integral part. Moreover, they also pledged to defend Ghaznavid territories from other Turkic tribes. Seljuk leadership stated that, if, God forbid, the Sultan does not agree, we do not know what will happen, for we have nowhere else to go. Were they actually that However, worried? Masud, distrustful because of previous damage inflicted by Seljuks in his territory, declined the offer and prepared to march for war. This expedition was a total disaster, that <clears throat> ended when the Sultan's army was hit by a cavalry ambush on the plains near Nasser in June 1035. Oh really, While they got the hit by an ambush? Acceded to the now seemingly quite modest Seljuk demands, the Seljuks, feeling in control of the situation, began sending even steeper demands. Oh. When these were declined, Seljuk hordes swept through Khurasan, mm. capturing all of it, including the great cities of Merv and Nishapur by Oh, well, they just dominated. The sole exception was Balk, which remained in Masud's grip. War Why was that the exception? The just because he was there? Years, with ever more Ghaznavid forces being poured into the defense of Khurasan against the Seljuks. Though we don't know much about the campaigns, we have an idea of why the nomads eventually won. Masud's armies were incredibly powerful, having inherited traditions of Indian elephant use and possessing high-quality, heavily armoured Mamluk slave infantry. 
okay that's very interesting they've got the uh, uh the ad adaptation of both of those two armies and they're using those to the potential that's really interesting However, and I assume that stays um, relevant throughout their sort of uh, time. Uh, they might adapt it slightly, but I'd imagine that, that they, they kept those two integral parts of their warfare. These tactics were not suited for extended steppe warfare. While the swift, lightly armoured Seljuk Turks, mounted on their fast horses, had little issue. Mm, the potential for the Seljuk issue. cavalry armies to attack anywhere allowed them to stretch and scatter Masud's armies thinly across the entire Khurasan area. Oh, that's a really combination. Really Although cool sometimes combination. successful in restoring their authority in some areas, the Ghaznavids failed to resecure the province and were eventually met for the final battle at the small town of Dandanakan near Merv in May 1040. A massive Ghaznavid army, with many dozens of elephants in tow, marched from Nishapur towards Merv in mm -hmm. search of the Seljuks but its legions of troops were exhausted from the long desert road and a lack of supplies. When a brawl broke out between the Sultan's elite oh, yeah, the guard and his regular soldiers the over the use here. of a water source, Chagri, who had been quietly shadowing Masud's lumbering army with his own units, pounced just as the Ghaznavid squabbling was reaching its peak. Mounted Seljuk Ghazi, wielding their fearsome composite bows, swarmed the numerically superior but mm. disorganized force that was arrayed in front of them, completely destroying the enemy army. What a shame. Masud fled back towards India, but quickly met his death in a palace coup. After the victory at Dandenikan, the Seljuks seemed to have been in a state of disbelief. They first refused to believe Masud had been defeated, and it is said they kept themselves close to their horses in fear of being caught by surprise when the Ghaznavids returned. Oh, they fought. When the leadership eventually did realize just how crushing their triumph had been, they set about securing Khurasan for themselves. Oh, they didn't Hostile think they... Sources emphasized... That's so funny. They were so worried at the start that they didn't... They didn't realize that they had for such a miraculous victory that they were able to then just completely take the area over that they 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 didn't want to believe it at first and when it finally come come about they were like yeah we we, we need to be quick time about this size devastation in the province caused by the seljuks and their mm. animals but it can't have been entirely their doing after all masud's giant army had also been placing a severe burden on the region during years of campaigning yeah. Pro Seljuk texts especially emphasize the role that Tugril played in restoring order and crushing the bandits which had arisen following the collapse of Ghaznavid authority. Okay. Rather than acting as a steppe warlord with his boot on the necks of those whom he had conquered, Tugril, who became the prominent Seljuk triumvir at this point, began to act in the manner of a legitimate Islamic ruler. Mm. It is said that Tugril even went so far as to threaten suicide if his brother Chagri sacked the city of Nishapur. Upon taking his seat on... That's a really interesting dynamic as well. Um, yeah, and that he wanted to use that to be able to sort of diplomatically get his way through the situation instead of causing havoc. Masud's throne in the city, Tugril claimed the title of Sultan and asked for guidance from the Islamic judges installed mm -hmm. by the previous regime, proclaiming that we are new men and strangers and we do not know the Persians' customs. The Turks had accepted Islam once again, very interesting, Islam, but had done so on their own terms, with nomadic traditions, customs mm. and tribesmen still making up the majority of Seljuk strength. From this point, a Turkic flavor was added to the Islamic world, which it still maintains to this day. It also seems that the first elements of Seljuk statehood began to appear, with coins being minted in the name of Tugril and the Caliph in Baghdad, who was still symbolically revered as the leader of Islam. Once again, that's very interesting that um, there was a Turkic sort of flair and spice added into it. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. That was really interesting and this is now the sort of period where they sort of become a state yeah i've really enjoyed this this reaction thanks for just uh, thanks for the suggestion each seljuk leader went on their own path at about this time 
yeah. Musa was given Herat to govern, while the two leading partners, Chagri and Tugril, were given the eastern and western areas respectively. The former repulsed a series of attempted Ghaznavid reconquests from India. Oh, again, I, I've been a bit mistaken. I thought they had got the whole Ghaznid area, but they haven't. I was mistaken. India and began Seljuk raids on Sistan, while his brother prepared to advance west deeper into the Islamic mm. world. The areas of Iraq and Iran not yet under Seljuk control were, for the most part, ruled by a group of Shiite princes known together as the Buyids. Very These regional sovereigns often like to know a bit more about those uh, princes during this period of time, or just how that area was sort of run. Squabbled and jostled with one another for power. Mm. Beginning in about 1080, through a mix of diplomacy, opportunistic backing of regional allies, and outright conquest, the militarily supreme Seljuks asserted sovereignty over the Iranian plateau. As nomads, the Seljuks largely concentrated on the countryside pasture for their animals and a few smart. main cities, such as Ray and Hamadan, which serve. I said smart, but of course it makes sense. That's the only real option that they have. As basis. Aside from these strategic settlements, Tugril made little effort to assert direct rule over urban areas. Therefore, many city dwellers in the annexed lands experienced almost no change in the short term and local princes were even allowed to continue their own feuding, as long as they did it under Seljuk auspices. In the Once again, that's a very interesting dynamic. So, <clears throat> they're allowing all of the people to stay in their castles, fight over their individual squabble, squabbles, um, use your men, keep using your men to fight your little squabbles. Okay, two of you get one of these petty castles, that don't matter to us. We get all the lands, and obviously you pay us money, because if not, we wreck your castles. That's a really interesting dynamic. Never thought about um, it sort of like being outplayed like that. But again, yeah, it's just, it's easy. Let them squabble between themselves, waste their resources, but as long as they pay us and they just don't bother us, that's absolutely fine. That's a really interesting dynamic. this period, we also have clear evidence of Seljuk administrative practices. In the key cities under direct rule, agents were installed, essentially Turkic governors who prioritized the raising of revenue from the cities they governed. Mm -hmm. As the realm's governance matured though, it became more than just wealth extraction. <clears throat> After Isfahan was conquered in 1051, a system of tax exemptions was put into practice to tempt peasants back onto lands that they had previously abandoned. I see. Forts were also constructed in order So I see. So the original taxes caused people to not live on that land and then what they've done is they reduced it so that they entice people to come back in okay in order to ensure the security of nearby roads from bandits a measure intended to reassure merchants and boost trade activity mm. Tugril's actions so far had attracted the attention of baghdad's abbasid government particularly caliph al qaim's vizier a man named ibn muslima the greatest of Tugril's achievements however was yet to come Abbasid rulers had largely lost political control over the peripheral regions of their formerly vast empire by the 11th century. I see. But there was an understanding that the Caliph in Baghdad was the symbolic leader of Sunni Islam and had to be respected as such. However, the Shiite Buyids occupying Iran barely acknowledged his authority at all, mm. leading to a Sunni reaction in the Round City, a reaction led by Al Qaim's aforementioned vizier who was known for his fanatical hatred of the Shiites. So once again, that, that sort of uh, political divide within there has sort of encouraged this conflict here. He saw the potential <clears throat> of these increasingly powerful Sunni Turks as allies, and despite his caliph's initial suspicion, convinced al Qaim to establish good relations with Tugril. In Muslima's mind, the Seljuks would be a deadly sword for use against his rivals in the city, most prominently the commander of Baghdad's Turkic slave troops, a mm. Shiite general named al Basasiri. The vizier and Tugril planned extensively for Seljuk intervention in the city of peace. Muslima had various religious titles granted to the Turk leader, and in 1053, 
proclaimed persecution of heretics in both Baghdad and Tughril city of Nishapur simultaneously. The intended symbolism was clear. Tughril and the Abbasid Caliph were allies, and al qaim's enemies were Tughril's enemies, making the Ooh. latter a legitimate sultan. Okay. With the road paved specifically for his advice. Just sort of like drawing a line in the sand there, aren't they? Months, a nomadic Seljuk army advanced into Khuzistan on the borders of Iraq, its leader proclaiming that he intended to perform the Hajj, the traditional pilgrimage to Mecca, and to lead an expedition against the Shiite Fatimid Caliphate of Egypt afterwards. Whether or not Tugrul actually intended to do this is irrelevant. It was another piece of deliberately engineered propaganda aimed at showing his credentials as a legitimate Sunni ruler. Seeing oh. the writing on the wall, General al Basasiri fled Baghdad. Yeah, he then, knew. finally, Tugrul and his Seljuks peacefully entered Baghdad in December of 1055. I'm glad that it was peacefully. During the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. Mm, they were welcomed okay. by a procession of local notables and crowds which had gathered to see what was happening. It is at this moment of Sultan Tugrul's greatest achievement that we shall leave him and conclude by examining just how far the Seljuks had come and where they would go. Okay. In the later That was a nice little Yeah, introduction to to how they got there. The I really enjoyed that. Seljuk and his tiny group of only a hundred Oghuz Turks had crossed into the Muslim world as irrelevant pastoralists. Less than a century later, his grandson was riding into Islam's most glorious city at the head of a massive Turkic army, tens of thousands strong, having received the formal backing of Islam's most revered religious figure. Mm -hmm. Though this was likely the proudest moment of Tugril's life, the apogee of the great Seljuk Empire was yet to come when it fought against the Fatimids and invaded Anatolia, eventually defeating the Romans at Manzikert a few decades later. Wow, they did we do always some have big more stories feats. to tell, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. What a good reaction. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you very much, guys. What should I jump on to next? I've got a couple more in me.